I'm number one, 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 one. Thanks for checking out another Jost Productions video. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at Spanish colonization of the quote-unquote New World and really focus on what they were doing in what would become the United States of America. So if you're an APUSH student, a U.S. history student, a freak or geek on the internet, I hope you enjoy. And so this story of Spanish colonization really begins with one man getting lost, looking for a water route to Asia, and that of course happens in 1492. You know who sailed the ocean blue. That is Christopher Columbus. And he doesn't get to India, he gets to the Bahamas, in October and his mission was a failure not only was he a failure he's not even the first one to get to the Western Hemisphere there were Norse Vikings that had already done it there are others who had already done it but Columbus does something important now for the first time the world will never be the same again because the futures of four continents are now connected and what happens is Columbus gets there, he makes a couple of voyages, four, and his arrival in the quote-unquote new world sparks this Colombian exchange. A whole new world emerges. Where you have this exchange of animals and plants and disease and people uh, between the continents of Africa, Europe, South America, and North America. And you can take a look at this. All sorts of things that they never knew existed in, in different parts of the world are now coming across these oceans. Um, it is a variety of items, and I'll just point out a couple of important ones. Smallpox. Smallpox was not a part of Native American life in the Western Hemisphere before 1492. And it's really going to be smallpox and other diseases from Europe and Africa that are going to lead to a massive population decline for the native people of the Western Hemisphere. Other things, well, they get them back because something they didn't have in Europe, syphilis. So syphilis comes from the New World and goes to Europe and causes all sorts of havoc. So you have this huge population decline in the Western Hemisphere, but you also have a huge population increase in Europe in particular because things like potato and corn, which are high in calories and cheap and easy to grow, they allow for a huge population bump in parts of Europe. So this Colombian exchange is taking place and it reshapes the world in whole new ways. One example that's going to have a huge impact is going to be the introduction of the horse in the western hemisphere a lot of people have this image of native americans riding horses and and doing all sorts of different things like hunting or gathering but the horse didn't exist before 1492 spanish conquistadors introduced the horse as do other european explorers and this is going to have a huge impact not all of it positive in fact for a lot of native americans Suddenly now they're going to have this new animal that's going to allow them to increase the size of their range and they're going to come into contact with other Native American groups and this is going to increase warfare between Native American tribes. So the horse is just one example of how this European invasion of the New World is going to shape the lives of Native people. Now, one of the things that happens is Spain's the first, but other countries are quick to follow. You got Portugal, you got France, you got Dutch. And what happens is the two countries, two Catholic countries, Spain and Portugal, work out a deal and they basically figure out this is mine and this is mine. And it's worked out in this Treaty of Tordesillas. In 1494, with the, with the work of the, the help of the Pope, they come up with this deal where they create this imaginary line right there along the, the globe. And on the west of that line would be Spanish territory. And on the east of that line would be Portuguese territory. Now, if you're looking at it, you're probably thinking, Portugal got screwed. Well, the reality is in 1494, they didn't really know how big this continent, uh, these continents were, and so there was this kind of, you know, ignorance in this deal. Spain, Portugal are going to split up the New World. 
Now, I would like always like to think about the Treaty of Tordesillas and think about tortillas, and, and it's a really kind of stupid way of remembering things for the test. Spain hits the jackpot. And what I mean by that is there were a number of Native American societies, a huge number, but two in particular had enormous wealth. Their, their populations were the equivalent of European cities at the time. They were highly advanced civilizations and they had enormous wealth. And what happens is the Spanish come across them and conquer them. Let's not forget what the Spanish found when they came to the New World. Oh, mountains. In fact, you get, of course, Cortes in 1522 conquering the Aztec Empire and Francisco Pizarro in 1532 conquering the Incan. Now, for us that are studying for a push, um, this is not important except that it is because one of the reasons why not a lot of Spanish colonists are going to go north is because the wealth was in places like Mexico, Peru, Cuba, and the other parts of the Caribbean. So this is happening, but there are many conquistadors who are going to be looking for the next jackpot. Why, for years they've been ravaging the new world of its most precious resources. In fact, you get all sorts of explorers. You get Vasco Nunez Balboa, who discovers the Pacific Ocean. The native people already knew it was there. And he gets this Spanish claim to this, this part of the world. You get Magellan, who in 1519 leaves Spain with five ships, goes all the way around South America, gets to the Philippines, and is killed. But one of his ships in 1522 makes it back, being the first to circumnavigate the globe. You get once, Juan, once, Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513, looking through Florida, looking for gold, looking for a fountain of youth, all these different theories about what he was looking for, but he's looking for wealth. Um, he thought Florida was an island, you know, very limited knowledge of what they're looking at. And eventually, Ponce de Leon is killed by a Native American arrow when they resisted his encroachment on their land. You get a guy by the name of Francisco Coronado in 1540 who's looking for these fabled golden cities and he's going into the southwest and he's looking in today what is New Mexico. He gets all the way towards what is today Kansas and he's looking for this wealth and instead he finds Adobe Pueblo Native American tribes. Um, but you have the Spanish looking for these opportunities. And the Spanish Empire grows. And like I said, the center of the empire, the, the concentration, where the most people are going to go, are going to be in what is today Peru, in Mexico, in the Caribbean. Very few people are going to go up into what is today the United States. And that's important to know for those of you taking a push. Now here's the thing that happens. The Spanish had this very complex, confusing relationship with the native people. And it was based upon this assumption that these, these, these people that they were coming into contact, these complex societies, they were nothing more than... In fact, one of the systems that develops, especially in places in the Caribbean, in Mexico, and Peru, is this encomienda system. And it basically means to entrust. And the Spanish government would give Native American people to the colonists, the Spanish colonists, and of course they have to promise to convert them, to Christianize them, to, to protect them. And this system takes place, and this is very different than what the English colonists are going to do. Because the Spanish are going to kind of try to... Um, in their words, protect, but in reality, the encomienda system was nothing more than a form of Welcome to slavery. The Native American people were basically forced into a harsh, brutal labor system that was basically slavery. And so this was the reality. But the other part of the reality, which is interesting to note, this is a Spanish pain. And what you'll notice if you look carefully is that there was this 
racial mixing among Spaniards and native people, or later on when they start importing slaves in from West Africa, you have this merging of cultures. You have this blending of the old and the new worlds. You get people, for instance, uh, called mestizos. Little Michael Jackson there for you, and it probably is not appropriate for mestizo because a mestizo is a mixture of somewhat of European heritage and indigenous Native American heritage. You call them mestizos. You also get mulattoes, where you get this mixing you see over here. Espanol con mora. And, and for instance, the Caribbean, you have very often Spaniards marrying uh, slaves or people brought in forcibly from Africa. So you have this, this racial mixing going on throughout the Spanish Empire, and you're creating all new groups of people. Now keep in mind, very often this relationship, these relationships were, were based upon power and force and all sorts of things going on here, but this is something unique about the Spanish Empire. Now, of course, where do we begin, which is, are they ever going to go to North America? In 1565, they do establish their first permanent settlement. Number one, 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 one. In San Andreas. In 1565. And really, that's a result of the fact that there were actually French settlers already in that area. French settlers who were hanging out there, and the Spanish get rid of them, they conquer them, and rename the area St. Augustine. They also want to protect that valuable area of the Caribbean where lots of sugar and rum and other items are coming from. So Spain's initial move into what is today the United States is going to be very limited because the wealth wasn't up there. Now, people are going. As I mentioned, Ponce de Leonode, Ponce de Leon. Coronado, these people, and eventually, they are going to establish a Spanish presence in the modern-day United States. And the, the, the main form of the Spanish Empire in this area is going to be the Catholic mission, the Catholic Church. In fact, you could see on the map on the right, tons of churches starting to pop up. Now, this did not come without resistance. Native people, very often, were actors in this process, and very often they were trying to resist it. One famous example comes when a guy named Juan, in 1598, starts going on an adventure up into what is today the territory of New Mexico. And he comes across native tribes, and along the way they resist, and he punishes them with full-on force. One leg is chopped off for every man over the age of 15. All the rest of the population are forced into slavery. It's a horrible, horrible, brutal pattern of conquest. Now here's what happens. The Spanish have a presence in this area. They establish what is today Santa Fe in 1610. So around 1609, they're in what is today New Mexico. 1610, the capital Santa Fe is established. And what are they doing there in 1610? Well, they're converting the native people. The Catholic Church is there. And they're converting the native people, and the native people eventually are getting tired of it. And you get a guy by the name of Pope. And Pope is a Pueblo... Uh, Indian and Pope uh, in 1680 is going to lead a massive and in a rare instance of victory a rebellion that's going to kick out the Europeans from modern day New Mexico and this of course is the Pueblo Revolt <laughs> Hundreds of Spanish colonists are killed. The Catholic institutions, the missions, the churches in the area are destroyed by the native people. They actually put one of their own ceremonial Native American religious uh, institutions on top of the Catholic Church. And it is a victory for 12 years. For 12 years, the Spanish are kicked out of this region. And it's not until 1692 that they come back. And when they come back, they have to accommodate some aspects of Native American culture. They have to respect it a little bit more because they know the Natives, at least at this moment, have the numbers. And they can, and they will, and they've shown that they're able to rebel. So the Pueblo Revolt, a success for 12 years, the Spanish come back. 
and the natives are able to continue some of their religious practices while implementing and blending some of the Catholic ones that are being imposed upon them. Spain continues to grow. <laughs> And a couple things you need to be aware of. In 1716, they establish a settlement at, his, at what is today San Antonio in Texas. And they're really establishing this because you got these French explorers that are coming down the Mississippi River. And these French explorers that are coming down these rivers, such as the Mississippi, they're threatening the Spanish Empire. So they established this settlement in 1760. They established in 1769 a mission in California, the first of 21 that will eventually form. And what you see in this area known as New Spain, you have Spanish settlement taking place, but it's relatively weak. In fact, if you take a look at the population by 1700, by 1700, even though the Spanish were first, there will be 250,000 people living in the English colonies. 15,000 will be living in the French and only 4,500 Spanish colonists in what is today North America. So Spain looks pretty impressive on a map, but the reality is the majority of their wealth and their focus was on the rest of their empire. That's going to close us out. If you're studying for A-Push, make sure you know these terms and these ideas and these concepts and people. And if you're just learning for the sake of learning, thank you for checking out my video on Spanish colonization in the quote-unquote new world. Make sure you subscribe to Joe's Productions. Make sure you like the video. Post comments. Ask questions. I'll try to reply. Peace.